Welcome. All right, so in this video, what I want to do is talk about some common misconceptions when dealing with implied domain. And basically what I'm going to be doing here is providing you four false statements and looking to provide a counterexample that is going to show why those statements are false. So the first example that I want to work with is all functions have a maximum of only two domain restrictions. And I bring this up, um, you know, because a lot of times when we are working with implied domain and domain restrictions, we're usually only dealing with, you know, one or two domain restrictions. But I think it's important for students to understand that, you know, we don't need to stop at just one domain restriction. Let's just deal with a, you know, basic one. Like, obviously, we have a square root, and, you know, you can't take the, um, you know, the square root of a negative number or the fourth root. And then usually we talk about, you know, you can't divide by zero. But, you know, a lot of times it, it's, it's important to just recognize that just because a lot of the examples that we've done here have only included like one or two um, discontinuities doesn't mean that you know we cannot you know continue like there is no limit to the number of values that we could have in, inside the denominator um, also with piecewise functions typically you know we keep piecewise functions between two and three example you know two and three uh, equations but you know you could have a lot of different uh, jump discontinuities that are not defined um, inside this function or holes right and so you don't need to just have two equations three you know we could break this up into four five and six with the piecewise function with a lot of different discontinuities so um, there is not a maximum of the number of domain restrictions that you could have on a function um, and here are two examples you know of functions that have multiple restrictions obviously this is just an example but you can see here we have three domain restrictions uh, the next one is the domain of a function is different if the discontinuity is a whole compared to a vertical asymptote. And usually this comes about um, when students are working on this algebraically. So I think it's important to kind of look at the graphical approach from this as well as the algebraic. So for instance, if we're looking at a graph here, and let's look at the number 2. So this graph has a whole at 2. It is defined, the domain is defined for all real numbers except for 2, whereas this graph has a vertical asymptote at negative 2. And let's just draw a graph that looks like this. Um, something like that, OK? So you can see that both these functions are defined for all real values except for negative 2. However, this is a whole, and this is a vertical asymptote. Well, it doesn't matter which one is which, because I just said the domain is exactly the same for both these functions. Where we usually get stuck here is when we're dealing with the algebraic approach. Because when students are, you know, simplifying or you know, given a function, what they, you know, sometimes will get is like, you know, x times x minus two over this, you know, x minus two. And what they see is they, oh, the x minus 2s divide out, right? So therefore, it's like no longer there. No, what that just tells you is that the discontinuity is removable, and it's a whole. And where, where in comparison, if I just had like x over x minus 2, since the discontinuity of you know, 2 in the denominator is not removable like it was up here, that just means it's a vertical asymptote. So no, it does not matter if the discontinuity is a vertical asymptote or a whole in regards to the domain. That it just, it's obviously going to be different on the graph and as well as algebraically, but the domain, it doesn't mean it doesn't change. The next one is all rational functions have a restriction on their domain. And this one comes up, you know, a lot. A lot of times when we, we've worked on so many examples here where we have, you know, something in this denominator and we're kind of used to saying, all right, whatever's inside, whatever's in the denominator, we want to set equal to zero because that is not going to be in the domain. Well, then we just got to look at, well, what if then what was inside my denominator was like an example like x squared plus 4, right? And so therefore, when you set x squared plus 4, uh, I'll just set it over here, x squared plus 4 equal to 0, what happens here is when you try to solve, what you notice is you can't solve x, plus, x squared plus 4 in the real number system. Oops, uh, I'll do that. Because you're now you're going to have to take the square root of a negative number. And if we look at this graphically, you can see that 1, 2, 3, 4. This graph is going to continue going up. It's never going to cross the x-axis. So therefore, it's never going to equal 0. And again, you could even just think about this just by picking numbers. Pick any real numbers that you want to, plug them in for x, and then add 4 and square them, and then add 4. You're never going to get to 0. So therefore, this graph, I don't know what the graph looks like, 
but I know that the graph has a domain of all real numbers. It is not restricted. And the same really understanding works with it, works with radical functions. When we have a function and we have a square root, I should say, not a, just all radicals, but at least a square root, um, and actually that kind of brings up to my other point, which I didn't mention in my class. But when you're dealing with the square roots, as long as this value is always greater than zero, so again, like let's do the x squared plus four. You know, x squared plus four. So one, two, three, four. This function is always greater than zero, right? The, it's always greater than zero. So it's, you know, because whenever we have this, whatever's inside the box, we always set greater and equal to zero. Well, x squared plus four is always greater and equal to zero. It's never gonna go down to zero or below. So therefore, this function is um, defined for all real numbers. And again, the notice I use radical, not square root. Even though we do a lot with the square root, it's important to note that um, f of you know the cube root of x, it doesn't matter here what's under this radical because this function is, if you look at the graph, it's the domain is all real numbers and the range is all real numbers. So it's important to know that when you're dealing with a even square root, your func your radicand is going to your or at least your function is going to be defined for values that are greater or equal to zero. But when you're dealing with a odd index, it doesn't matter what's in the radicand as far as it's still going to be all real numbers. So those are some basic uh, misconceptions that I came up with uh, in my class regarding uh, domain, implied domain. And what I would love to hear from you is, you know, what are some maybe questions or statements that you came up with that uh, you think would be really good as far as finding a uh, counterexample that we could use um, you know, that would be a good question for students to help with their understanding. So I look forward to kind of seeing some of those in the comments and uh, till the next one. Cheers.